So um, if you're ready, Rogan, we can sure. go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome everyone. This is going to be Rogan Hamby presenting about connecting Evergreen to external services. Um, I'm going to drop the caption link in the chat one more time and I'll actually drop it in a couple more times throughout the event. So if you click the link that I just put in the chat, that will be where our live captioner will be recording everything here. Thank you to Marcia for that. And thanks to our sponsors, Evergreen Community Development Initiative for sponsoring the platform and Mobius for sponsoring captioning. Uh, with that, Rogan, over to you. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, let us try this screen sharing thing. There we go. Folks should be able to see my screen connecting Evergreen to external services. If you cannot, please let me know in chat. My name is Rogan Hamby. I work for the Equinox Open Library Initiative. A lot of you probably know me and know. For those who don't, we're a services provider that provide open source support in libraries for things like Koha, Subjects Plus, Coral, and of course Evergreen, which we're all here for. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I like to take questions as we go. So if anybody has any, please feel free to drop them in chat. I will try to keep an eye on chat, but I will also ask for Andrea to help out. I am talking, Marie. You cannot hear me. Can others hear me? You, yes. Uh, let me um, check in the chat. Um, but go ahead, Rogan. I'll see if I can help them with that. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll keep going. So feel free to ask questions as we go. The first thing I want to say up is who this is for. And the audience of this presentation is not these people. This is not a developer presentation. This is not geared towards highly technical people, uh, or at least highly technical people who've had time to look into this stuff. This is oriented towards frontline library support staff, people who are either the most technical person at their library, and so even though it's not their job, they end up dealing with support requests related to uh, technology vendors, or perhaps they're support uh, services librarians, systems librarians. And of course, a systems librarian knows that they have a lot of different things to support and they're not gonna become an absolute guru on all the esoterica of any one product that they support. So this presentation does have technical elements to it but we're not going to be talking about development. We're not going to be talking about hardcore server administration. We're going to be talking about largely things that you can do from the front, from a web browser, connecting to Evergreen, or things that you're going to talk to a vendor about. Uh, I see there's some folks who still can't hear me. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna keep going and hopefully these technical issues will work out. Yeah, Andrea, can you speak a moment and see if they can hear you? Check, check, check. Um, I think most uh, people can hear, can hear us. And of course these sessions are being recorded. Um, and you can also, we are having live captioning so if you want, if you can't hear, uh, I recommend clicking on the live caption link and following along um, yeah. as well. And I'm sorry, we've been having some some synchronicity issues uh, with Hopin that we've been putting out as they occur, but I apologize for the difficulty. Yeah, and unfortunately those issues are on Hopin's side. So there's little we can do other than poke the Hopin folks and uh, try to put their attention on them as they come up. Okay. Great, sounds like it's working for more folks now. Some some hamster has woken up in its cage. Good. So what I was saying very briefly is that this presentation is not for developers. It is not for highly technical work. It is for frontline people who have to talk to technology vendors. 
such as perhaps somebody selling you an external service that validates against your evergreen patrons or a discovery service, a reader's advisory service, any number of things like that. And so they need to pull information from Evergreen in some way. And so this presentation is both going to be about pulling information from Evergreen, but also about these communication elements, talking to the vendors. So what are the kinds of things we're gonna talk about? Uh, what you can do from the staff client or web browser yourself, what information you can give to a vendor, and when you should escalate these things to your IT staff or hosting provider, and how to maybe make that a little bit easier on you. And we're going to go deep enough into some of the more technical elements so that you know what it is. It's not going to be a tutorial on these things. I'm not going to teach you how to do all the little bits and pieces, but we will try to give you an overview so that when we talk about uh, some of these methods of pulling information from Evergreen externally, you know what they are and what can be done. So some of the topics we are going to cover. We're going to talk about extracting records from Evergreen. We're going to talk about a service called SuperCat, which comes up on the listservs every now and then if you've been a long time uh, subscriber to the Evergreen listservs. Something called unAPI, open search. This thing called web scraping, which I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to, you can't see it, but I cringe every time I say it. We're going to talk about reports, SIP2, and database access. And this is a pretty motley crew of ways to ex connect external services to Evergreen and get information out. In most of these cases, that is one way we're just pulling information out. Although a couple of these do provide potential for two-way information uh, and, and to issue changes to Evergreen. And we'll talk about that a little bit. First, we're gonna talk about the easy one, bibliographic record extracts. Now, you can do extracts from the staff client. That's good news. And when do you want to do that? One, when the exports are infrequent. I mean, if you only need it one time or you don't know when you're gonna need it, it's easy just to do them from the staff client yourself. And when it's a fairly low number, by low, I mean a few thousand. The big limiter here isn't really the size, but the amount of time it takes to generate them and send them. Because if something kills your downloading of them along the way, you're gonna to have to start all over from scratch and it's frankly kind of a pain. And you also need to do it when you can identify a range of bib graphics with IDs because the bib extract does require that you supply a list of IDs to bring out. And you can do that with reports. You can go into reports and say, hey, I want a list of all the IDs of the bib records that were edited last year for some reason or were edited by a certain staff member. And I want to put those into an extract. or when they're in a bucket. You don't have to provide the IDs from a report, you can also use a bucket. So these are all convenient ways to get a list of bib IDs and grab the bibs. But sometimes it makes more sense to go to your hosting provider, your IT staff, however you're running Evergreen, and request an extract from the server side. One of this is when it's recurring and frequent. I mean, if you're say providing a bibs to a new bibs to some sort of reader's advisory service every month, and you know they want them on the first of every month, why have somebody do that manually? That can be set up by your IT support staff to run in a recurring manner. Also, it's a very large number of records. You may want it done from the server. If you have 700,000 records in your database, it may not make sense to download them from a client, especially if you have spotty internet, but it can be run very reliably from the server and sent to you. Also, if the criteria is too complicated for a staff client report, um, 
the reporter in Evergreen is very powerful. It does a lot of things, but sometimes you can have criteria that are just too complicated for it. And in that case, somebody on the server side may need to put together a SQL report to generate those IDs and do the export. What the IT staff will need to know if you do ask them to do a bibliographic export for them is where to send the output to. Uh, this is not going to be an email address. They're going to need something like an FTP address because the files are going to be probably too large for, I, for an email unless we're literally talking about dozens. Are, are we talking about all records or do you need to supply some criteria? If there's criteria, be as specific as you possibly can. Do you need the records in Mark 21 or Mark XML? If you don't know what those are, probably Mark 21. That is kind of the standard, the most standard form of moving Mark records around. Are we going to include holdings in this? You just want the bib itself or do you want tags with holdings? Now, this can be important because Mark 21 records have a limit on them. And if the vendor you're sending records to uses Mark 21, it is actually pretty easy if your records have a lot of holdings to break the size limit of Mark 21 records, in which case they either need to be able to ignore the size limits of Mark 21 or they need the records in Mark XML. But with these criteria, it's pretty easy to talk to support staff and get a bid extract set up. So Supercat. Supercat is not something that comes up every day on the listserv, certainly, but if you've been around a while, you've probably at least heard of it. And this is a link to the evergreen docs that discuss it. It goes more in depth than I'm going to here. I'm going to give you a brief introduction. Supercat is another way of getting data about holdings out of Evergreen to an external service. And again, this could be a discovery layer. It could be a reader's advisory service. It could be any number of things. It could be an app that's being developed on phones for helping people browse your collection. And what Supercat does is through URLs, HTTP web browser type communication, get information on bibs, ISBNs, and meta records. So let's go ahead and go through an example. I'm not going to be brave and do live demoing here. I'm just going to do stuff on slides, but these slides will be posted later on the conference website. And of course, the video recordings will be available later on YouTube. If you take this URL and you replace your host with your actual evergreen ILS URL, then you can get this. This huge blob of text here is the different kinds of formats available from Supercat. This may sound really cryptic right now, but when we talk about these formats, all these are the formats supported by your evergreen. Now, it may match this list exactly, it may not, depending on what version of Evergreen you're running, but that hasn't changed recently. Uh, the slides are moving, and I, I'm watching Chad, and I see people are having audio issues. Uh, are people not seeing the slides change, or is that only some folks having issues? I think that's only some folks having the issues. Okay. Um, yeah, I can see that we're on your super cat slide with the blob of text. Yeah. Um, those of you having issues, maybe you can try changing browsers. Um, really sorry for the amount of hop in issues that we're having. Um, I'm actually writing them all down in a document to take the hop in uh, yeah. later today. So, uh, yeah, I just don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, the video will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, uh, for those who I know somebody saying they're having issues with Chrome on a Mac, I'm actually watching this as a viewer on Chrome on a Mac. So there may be plugins with issues or something else. I don't know offhand, I'm afraid. Um, 
So I, I'm just going to have to move ahead for now. And Andrea is capturing these issues as best she can for feedback to hop in. So these are the formats. And some of these formats are things like OPAC, which is only going to be really meaningful to Evergreen, HTML holdings. But some of these, like the Atom formats and the RSS formats, are very widely used outside the library community. So vendors that are looking to set up an external service to pull information from Evergreen should be familiar with how these types of data feeds work. They will probably have to do some development on their end to make use of the specific information being sent, but they know what Atom and RSS and things like that are. So let's look at this in practice. So, uh, and I should mention, in this example, I'm pulling bib records, which is indicated by this key term record at the end of the link. You can also pull authority and meta records by just changing that. So instead of formats forward slash record, change it to formats forward slash authority or meta record, and you can get a list of all the formats supported by those. So now we'll show an actual retrieval example. This is similar to before, except now we're going to say retrieve we're going to list one of those formats that we got from that previous listing we're going to add a record type and a record id again i'm not going into the detail to show you how to do this yourself all the time but i want you to know that this exists and what is possible when you talk to vendors and here's an example i did of one of my test servers uh, Insmith.lib was the name of my test server. I'm asking for a record, a bib record in the Atom format, and I gave it the bib number ID. And this is what it gave me. It's this Atom XML feed that gives me the various information about the record, including you see title, author, it's a copy of The Hobbit, and so on and so forth. So this is a way that external vendors can pull information from Evergreen. Now, they do need the bib record IDs for this. Now I'm going to show you another example of this. And this time, instead of the Atom XML, I'm going to do the HTML holdings. And this is probably, for a human being evaluating this, easier to read and more useful, and it certainly can be used in a variety of circumstances. You could use this to embed inside an HTML page with a tool. But it's probably less useful to vendors who are going to want structured data uh, to parse into their own products. Now, I mentioned this pulls a single bib record by its ID. Obviously, the vendor is going to need a list of IDs from somewhere. They're not going to call you up on the phone and say, hey, can you give me a list of all your new book IDs since the last time we did this? That'd be pretty inefficient. Um, so there's going to need some sort of automated way to do that. You could have somebody sit there and run a report every week and email it to them, but that's not terribly efficient either. Uh, the purpose of having computers is to do things automatically because we don't want to, right? So that's why Supercat has another tool. And it's called Freshmeet. Uh, and it's to provide a feed that will give you a list of bib IDs that you can limit by date as having either been imported or edited up to a certain number. So in this particular case, I can say, I want to go to the server. I want an Atom format bib records that have been imported up to 100 of them since a certain date. And this is an example of that. Again, my test server, Enzymuth, uh, Adam, Bib, I want everything edited, up to 100 of them since the 1st of January, 2020. And then we start getting this export. This time, instead of asking for a Bib ID and getting a single record, I'm going to get up to 100. And if you have somebody coming to you and saying, hey, you know, we have this service to, you know, display information about your new books on this community web thing. 
uh, but we need stuff from you to uh, help display it. This is all they need. This will give them that data and let them pull that information without you having to do anything special. Now, when do you want to use SuperCAP? Well, the short answer is anytime a vendor needs a real-time update of records, because that is an important thing here. If you, sure, a lot of this you can pull from reports. You could write a report to say, I want the titles and the authors and all that stuff of the records edited since a certain date. And you can generate that periodically and send it off. But this is real time. This will reflect constantly. So they could, somebody could create a super cat feed and programmatically say, every hour, give me all the new records added in the last hour. And a good example of something that this would be very useful for is discovery layers. Uh, now, and let's talk about practicality points. In most cases, they probably want to start with a baseline of information. You're probably not going to want to tell somebody if they're doing, say, a discovery layer, which needs a listing of all the bibs you have, they're not going to want to try to pull every record in your system with SuperCAP. You are probably either with a report or a bib extract going to want to give them a baseline, and then they'll use a tool like SuperCAP to get new changes. Now, it does, now you will probably want to reconcile periodically, but this is true of any time you're doing uh, this sort of external data sync. Now, how do I set it up? The short answer is you don't. It's already running on your server. It's an inherent part of Evergreen. And part of the point of this presentation is you don't have to be the developer for this. If somebody's coming to you and selling you a product as a library, you point them to the docs and tell them this is a tool in Evergreen for you to do this. That's on them. So now let's talk about an API or as I tend to call it in my head, UNAPI, which is wrong, but it's what I tend to do. So if I say UNAPI, I mean an API. Again, thanks to our lovely documentation community, uh, we have really good docs on the UNAPI. And it is essentially an alternative to SuperCAT. Like SuperCAT, you're gonna pull information from URLs. But it's called the unAPI because even though it's not an API, it has some API-like functions. And an API is basically a programming interface, a way to externally say, hey, give me this stuff, and it'll send it back. SuperCAT is too simplistic to be considered an API. An API is still too simplistic, but it's closer to an API than SuperCAT. And here's an example. It gets a little bit more complicated, a little bit more intimidating. But again, the takeaway I want you to have from this is what is possible with it, not how to do it. Because if you're talking to an external vendor and they're looking at providing support, you point them to the docs and them figuring out the mechanics is up to them. But in this example, we have a URL again, you plug in your host, and down here, you're gonna say that we want bibliographic record entry records. We're gonna provide a bib ID, one or more classes and a format. And you can leave the format off to see the available ones, just like we did with SuperCAT. In this case, it's a much smaller list, a holdings XML file, mark XML and mods 32. Any of these three are probably useful to external vendors. Uh, Mods 32 is going to be more library specific than the other two, but if they're a library vendor offering you a service, they may be familiar with it. They certainly should know how to parse holdings and uh, mark both in XML format. Let's talk about classes briefly. This is a longer list. This is the kind of stuff it can send back to you. BRE is the simplest. That is a bib record. And then we have Biblio record entry feed. That's a list of bib records, uh, call numbers, all kinds of stuff. And like before, we're going to do an example to give you some context for this. So here we're saying, I'm asking for a bib record information. I'm sending you 
a bib record ID, and I want holdings XML and call number data returned to me in the format of mods 32. And this is what it sends. Very simple. It's very straightforward. And it gives you that mods 32 data. And you can see the owning library, the call number because we requested it, and the copy level data in the holdings. Now, let's expand that a little bit. This is the same example as previously, except I've added ACP into that list right here. So the holdings XML, the call number ACN, and then ACP is copy, the asset copy. So now we're going to see output similar to before, but now we're going to also see specific copy level information like this barcode, the circ modifier of book that's OPAC visible, age protection is zero, that sort of stuff. So what makes an API better than SuperCAP? Both give us bib data, uh, but what makes it really better? Well, one is it can support limits and offsets. You know, that's not something you need to worry about too much, but the short version is, let's say a service does need to pull a thousand records, and that's really too many to pull at one time. Well, with SuperCAT, it's kind of all or nothing. With an API, you can say, okay, well, give me the first hundred, and then the next hundred, and then the next, and it can be split up that way for somebody writing something to pull that information from Evergreen. You can specify an org unit and org unit depths. This is really important for the holdings information, especially in a consortium, because it means that you can pull information specific to a library, even if many different libraries have all their holdings on one record. For say, an example, an ex where one library in a consortium is contracting out for an app, but it's not a consortial contract just for that library, this becomes really useful for that vendor. And you can retrieve by item barcode instead of bib, which is really nice. So when would one of your vendors want to use the unAPI? Basically, when they are talking about stuff to display and for copy level information, like a custom app, a discovery interface, any of those sorts of things, the same sort of things that you would use SuperCAT for. Um, a few years ago, I would have told people, you might want to design a carousel using this. That's a good example of something that you could use this for. Of course, carousels are now natively supported in Evergreen, and there's no need. But if you wanted to reinvent the wheel, so now let's talk about open search a little bit. Uh, again, many thanks to our documentation community. They've provided us an invaluable uh, tool by giving us the information. But I'm going to actually quote Wikipedia here. They give a good description of what open search is. It's a collection of technologies that allow the publishing of search results in a format suitable for syndication and aggregation. It goes back a good ways now, 16 years. Uh, it is, never became as widely used as I think it should have, but Evergreen does support it, which is really nice. And it's not to be confused with the fork of Elasticsearch by Amazon, which is also called OpenSearch. Totally different things. So again, what would you say to somebody about this? When would you invoke OpenSearch? Again, when you're talking to a vendor and they're saying, how do we get this information from your ILS to use in our product? You can say, one of the things Evergreen supports is open search. And if they say, hey, great, our product supports open search too for pulling in information, then you can just point them to those docs and they're good to go. You're done. Well, they might need some things like your org name and whatnot. You're halfway there. So web scraping. Web scraping, for those who don't know, is basically the practice of pointing a program that acts like a browser and reads web pages off a server and pulls the information off them. The short answer is don't do it. And if you have a vendor that says, we're just, don't worry about it, we're going to scrape your website, please ask them not to. Uh, it, it's not reliable, it's messy, there's just no good reason to. 
all these other things we've talked about, Supercat, an API, it'll give them structured information that's reliable and clean. This is messy and horrible. Um, and when things happen, like you switch, some libraries are going to be looking at switching to the new Bootstrap OPAC, it will break web scraping for a lot of applications using it out there because stuff's going to be presented differently. Uh, any routinely, OPAC changes could potentially do this. So why do some vendors suggest it? They see it as simple. They don't have to talk to anybody else. They just handle everything in-house. And if you find yourself in a situation where you do intend to have a vendor use web scraping of your OPAC, do talk to your ILS provider first, whether this is in-house IT people or you're hosted by an external service provider like Equinox, talk to them about it first because they're probably going to ask you to do some things like not during active hours. Nobody wants a bot doing 10 calls a second for hours and hours at the same time that you're trying to get books checked out to the after school program that just let out or, and things like that, or during the lunch rush, just not during active hours and limit concurrent hits. I, I've seen vendors do web scraping who go, oh, why not 150 connections a second? Uh, let's, let's, let's bring that down. And again, what number should they use? Talk to your provider first, talk to your IT people. They can help you out with this. Yes, and Jason Stevenson made a good point uh, in chat. Web scraping is more of a load on your server. And the short answer as to why is when we're presenting information to humans, we process it a bunch. Supercad and an API, that structured data, which again is better for the vendors who need that information, it's already in computer form. It's easy to serve up to them. So better ways. Well, web scraping is bad. We don't like web scraping. Um, an initial list of the alternatives, if they give an initial list of BIB IDs with data, whether it's from a BIB extract or a report, or it depends on the service and what they need, you can get that, let them get their database up and running, and then get updates from Supercat and unAPI. A discovery service is a good example of this. And you still want to limit the concurrent hits um, if they insist on doing web scraping. So we're getting down to about the last 18 minutes, and I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for a discussion and Q&A. So I'm going to kind of blast through these last couple of points. And one is reports. Uh, we mentioned before that you can use reports for BIB IDs, but honestly, you can pull anything from reports. Uh, you can... It, if you're working with a vendor that just does not know how to use bib records and you want to pull information from 500s for awards for their app they're doing for you you can do that with reports you can pull you know every individual mark record tag and structure exactly what they want that's fine but after this point we're going to start talking about things that are scary and that's because up to this point, I've really limited what I've talked to talked about to things that are copy and bib data. We're not terribly concerned about those. Those aren't sensitive. I nobody cares if the why if the whole wide world knows that they have copies of a particular book. Uh, that's not sensitive data. But patron data is sensitive, and so we have to be a lot more careful about. And this is also where we start getting into talking about that this presentation is about communication as well as technology. So reports, we talked about, you can pull from reports, bib and copy data, um, but you can also pull everything else. Now they have advantages, they can be scheduled, notification sent, they can be in CSV or XLS, and you can pull everything. Uh, disadvantages. Content can't be sent. In the case of the patron reports, that's an advantage. There are some things reports won't do. And there's no support for alternative formats. There's more that can be done in the back end on a server, although it may not be a quick thing. I will go and tell you when you approach your IT staff or your hosting support staff 
about alternative forms of reports, this is going to have to be a dialogue because what you want and what an external vendor tells you is easy may not in reality be easy for a number of reasons. Remember, that external vendor just wants to sell you a contract. They'll be very happy to make the problem your support staff's problem after the contract is signed. Um, so before you finalize on a product, do talk to your support staff about it before you fall in love with it. Um, and have a discussion about things like the patron privacy issue. Uh, I, I have seen vendors say, oh yeah, just set up a report to run all your patrons' names and emails and phone numbers and just FTP it over to us. Uh, no, Th that, that whether or not you want to use an external service and send them patron information is a whole other question. Uh, and it, it's not a question to be decided lightly. You can see my pre-conference yesterday and Becky's uh, uh, keynote this morning about that. But if you do make a decision to do that, make sure it is transferred securely. Make sure you have agreements with that vendor that you know how long they're going to retain the data and who has access to it and all those kinds of things. Um, and I already talked about these basic points. Server-side reports, you can make much fancier. SIP2 is a, another way uh, that you can get information on the system and you get information about patrons aside from reports. Now, SIP2 should not be confused with the telephony protocol. There's also a phone protocol out there called SIP2. This is one that was originally sort of specced out by 3M, and there's a PDF out there you can grab. I don't call it a standard. I call it a specification because it's more of a gentleman's agreement that is frequently abused than a standard. Um, there have been a number of extensions to SIP2 over the years. Many of them are very well and widely supported, but there's no governing body saying it's part of a standard. And there are parts of it that include language that have been interpreted differently by different entities. In fact, we have some options in the SIP2 server that Evergreen uses to switch its behavior based on some of those different interpretations. But it is kind of the common language of the library world. Everybody seems to support SIP2. Uh, we could have a very long discussion about why other things should have taken it over by now, but that is the situation we're in. And it supports both information and transactions. Unlike everything else we've talked about so far up and through reports, it will provide patron information and transactions. And by transactions, I mean you can have SIP2 send back messages that say, hey, yeah, try to check this book out, try to place this hold. Uh, try to do something with this fine, those sorts of things. But the major problem with it is that it's not encrypted, unless it is. SIP2 itself is plain text, which is not a good thing. There are ways to tunnel it through encrypted tunnels, and I do strongly recommend to people that they look at that as an option. And depending on whatever laws govern you at your municipality, county, state, or even national level, unless you're in the U.S., the U.S. doesn't have any national laws regarding this, uh, they may require you to tunnel it unless you fall under an exemption. There is no hard and fast rule about everybody in that regard. Too much variation in the world with privacy laws. Now, I do want to spend just a second demystifying SIP2. Uh, I, I work with libraries, with frontline staff all the time who do not have, you know, really dedicated IT staff, maybe they hire external people, and they end up talking to a vendor, and then they talk to me as one of their hosting provider people, and they're kind of this go-between talking about SIP, and it's very cryptic to them. And it's very simple, really. SIP2 is a protocol, and all a protocol is is a series of rules for communication, just like in the non-computer world. You know, when you hear about a protocol for a state dinner, it's rules for how people communicate at a state dinner. A computer protocol is the same thing. It's rules of how two computers talk to each other. And I'm not going to get into the technical details about message response pairs and all that. But all SIP does is let one thing uh, send a message to the other and get a response, like an ebook vendor saying, hey, I'm sending you this barcode and password. Are they legit? And Evergreen says yes or no. That's pretty much it. 
So don't feel intimidated by this kind of talk. Uh, you know, you sign up for a new ebook service and they need a SIP account. There's nothing magical going on. And I'll go ahead and say this. If they say, oh, well, Evergreen won't let us check this book out. There may be an issue that needs to be looked at in regards to the messages and then how it's conforming to what they expect. But Evergreen certainly can't tell an ebook vendor whether or not to check the book out. That decision is happening on their side. Uh, we're just sending information back. There may be an issue to look at, though. So what do you do when you're having a SIP2 account made? Well, when you're talking to your ILS help desk, whether it's internal with IT staff or hosting provider, you're going to want to give some information. Uh, we're going to say this is an ebook provider. Provide the IP address the SIP requests are coming from, because if you whitelist traffic, then your IT staff are going to need that. If you don't whitelist traffic, they can ignore it, but better to be prepared. The name for the account. If the ebook vendor wants to log in with an account of We Are Awesome, then that needs to be provided to your staff so they can set up that account with that name. If they don't care, we can make up a name. And then the IT staff will have to go in and do two things. Well, really three things. Create an evergreen account, a SIP server account, these are separate, but they must have the same username and password. And then restart your SIP2 service for that to take effect. Then in exchange, what your ILS support staff will give you is a vendor inversion. This is what, say, the ebook provider usually expects. The vendor, in our case, is going to be evergreen because much of the library world still doesn't acknowledge the distinct, the idea of an ILS that's not controlled by a corporate entity, the version of Evergreen you're running, the SIP server address and port, which your IT, ILS hosting staff can provide you, and then that username and password. And then an institution or location code. I've heard it referred to as both. And that will be all that your ebook vendor needs to set up your SIP account. Now, the last one I'm going to bring up is database access. Again, this is a way to pull up patron information. Obviously, with reports, there are concerns about patron information. It should not be sent by email. It should not be sent unencrypted. Uh, SIP2, because as patron information, I recommend encrypted tunneling. Database access takes all those concerns and adds more on top of it. And it feels like I've seen a spike in vendors asking for direct database access recently. This has major privacy concerns, both because it takes what could be a stream of information and turns it into a fire hose. And if they have right access, they could potentially change patron data. So first, check your laws governing patron information. And that really applies to uh, reports with patron information and SIP as well. And think about what you have to do to cover your own posteriors. Um, I don't know how to say this too strongly. Bring lawyers in. I'm not a fan of bringing lawyers in for every little thing, but if you're going to provide somebody database access to your system, and I would strongly recommend make sure they really need it and that you really want whatever this product agreement is, uh, you need to have legal waivers in place. It, 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 and if they look at you and say, we're not going to sign a waiver, my personal recommendation would be find a different product to fill whatever this need is. Uh, and I suspect that whatever your, your funding institutions, governing institutions are, whatever your library is, uh, will will want waivers in place for database access. And somebody asked a, a couple comments in chat I'll address real quickly. Which vendors are asking for database access? I'm not going to get into that on something that's going to be on YouTube. Um, but there are other people responding with some that may or may not include uh, the ones I'm thinking of. What exactly would a waiver be waiving? Uh, a waiver needs to include several things. One, if they only have read access, it essentially needs to waive 
uh, and it needs to address liability for if they do something with that information they shouldn't. And your contracts with an entity that has patron information need to address a number of points, including how they retain it, how they get rid of it, who has access to it, how it's used, all these things. And also, if they have any kind of update access to your database, and I'm not sharing my camera, so you can't see me cringing in pain as I say that. Uh, the waiver needs to waive you of liability for what they do. So if they hose your entire database, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I need to take off my, I work for a hosting provider hat for a second and, you know, put on my, I worked in public libraries for 20 years hat and say, uh, I would just tell somebody no if they ask for update access, just no. But it, are there people out there that want it? Absolutely. So anyway, uh, just got a few minutes left, so I'm blast through this last one. And this is really for those frontline folks out there who aren't techies, but talk to vendors all the time. This is going to be a phrase you hear, hey, can we have API access? API is a term that technically means one thing, but gets used in a lot of other ways. Does Evergreen have APIs? Yes. Does Evergreen have publicly web accessible RESTful APIs in the sense that they mean when they ask that? No. And part of that is the privacy of patron information and all this other stuff. Uh, Jason said Evergreen is basically an API. Yeah, yeah. Just not in the way they, a, a lot of entities in the wider world tend to say it. Uh, and part of that is intentional decisions to provide barriers that protect information. Uh, so when they come to you and they say, hey, can we have API access? Well, if they're just looking for bib and item data, take them back to Supercat and an API. They can pull what they need in those ways. If they need patron information, that's a whole other discussion. Okay, so that brings me to our end. We've got about three minutes. Uh, any question or discussion points people wanna have? Did not notice any additional questions other than the ones that you grabbed. Um, <clears throat> that came by in chat. Okay. So. Well, I hope this was useful to people. Um, again, it's not a super technical presentation. It wasn't meant to be. I, th you can have a lot of fun actually digging into things like SuperCat and an API. Sometimes people ask me, you know, well, you know, I'm not a developer. I don't have test servers. What can I do to look at some of this stuff? Well, that, I mean, if you want to play with Perl or Python, and look at ways to programmatically pull uh, holdings information from Evergreen, you can use these, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rogan. That was uh, very interesting and a really nice follow-up to um, some of your points with, with what Becky talked about in uh, her keynote.